February 2020, we walked on the Burmese crown for the sixth time. This spectacular country is bordered by India, Bangladesh, China, Laos and Thailand and has an original cultural and geographical position in Southeast Asia. This country fascinates, captures your attention and magnetizes yourself once you discovered it. It's a country of hills, of plateaus, of immense lakes, of pre-Himalayan peaks in the north, but also a country with coastal plains of the Andaman Sea. It has a unique ethnic mosaic in this part of the world, with more than 120 minorities known this day. This time, our travel will be an horizontal triptych including the Inle Lake, the Kingdom of Bagan, and finally Mindat, the heart of the Chin states. The Inle Lake is enclaved in the heart of the Shan state at 900 meters of altitude. It spreads on 150 kilometers square. It's almost 20 km long from the north to the south and near 10 km from east to west. The several markets located around the lake are a place to trade, of course, but also to share and meet between the different ethnicities. The markets have a 5 days rotation and are sometimes very distant, which implies to embark very early in the morning to appreciate the most of it. At the end of the channel, we enter in the region of Inta. These people living near the lake are living on fishing, vegetables growing, and have a way of rowing unique in the world, in this marshy area where it is hard to navigate. It consists in swaying at the back of the boat, standing on one leg, wrapping the other around the paddle to scull. The conical trap are used to imprison the fishes before harpooning them. But those fishermen, like many other now, are mostly doing figuration for tourists hungry for pictures to earn a few kiyaks. They often earn more money that way than in selling fish. We cross several villages built on stilts to go to Fondo and Nampan villages, respectively located on the east and on the southeast banks of the lake. The best way to emerge yourself is to get lost in the heart of the market, anywhere in the world. Here, it's often the place for a brew of ethnicity because the different tribes living nearby come to sell their production and buy fish from the lake or vegetable coming from the floating gardens. We are in the Pei-O minorities territory, so we'll mainly see these people during our trip. The Pei-O minority, also called Black Karens, because assimilated to the Karens people, are easily recognizable with their black or dark blue outfits. The traditional Pei-O outfit is a turban, a white shirt, a black or blue jacket, and long and black trousers for men. The woman's one is composed of five pieces, a blues, a jacket, a long yi covering the knees, a turban, and two large conical hairpins. But the modern world also cut them up and makes them lose their dress identity, replacing these traditional outfits by occidental clothes. Like every market around the lake, we can find here the essentials, vegetables, fruits, eggs, spices, fish and meat from diverse origins, many kitchen tools with plastic, lots of plastic, bamboo braided baskets and carpets, flowers, wooden local craftsmanship, laker, rings and brass or silver necklaces. But you can also shave, go to the hairdresser, have a tea or coffee with donuts or noodle soup, or eat some grilled over the coals chicken's feet skewer. Lotus weaving is one of the three main Inta's industries, except tomatoes growing. 
We thus can find giant floating fields and several places of manufacturing on the lake. It's a very long, fastidious work and exclusively feminine. After having harvested the lotus rods, they delicately cut them to extirpate the threads from inside, then roll them with the fingers and start again over and over until having a several meter long thread. Two months and 12 plants are needed to make a small lotus scarf, whereas two days are needed to make a silken one. But the lotus is also way more solid. Everything is made at the same place, from the making of the lotus thread to the fabrication of clothes, essentially scarves and long knee, made on an ancient spinning wheels and looms which form a line one next to the other in wide rooms opened on every side. Women are skillful, fast and concentrated. They handle the machine with ease and velocity. The colors are mixing from a machine to another or stretched on stalls to be rolled up in the shimmering light of the sun. This creates a very particular atmosphere in this studious ambience of wood slamming, of the friction of the rake on the fabric, adding to the sound of boat and jeans, which dock or leave the pontoon. The second industry of the Inle Lake is the manufacture of handmade silver jewels. This time it's a man activity, melting, cutting, sanding and even to inlay and assemble pieces. You cannot be in Inle and not try the famous chirots, Burmese cigars. It's the third industry of the Inta people. Again, women handle the task. The chirots are made from local tobacco, to which are sometimes added spices such as anise, mint, banana fibers, or even honey. The cigars are wrapped by hand in tea leaves and pasted with glue. Each woman makes approximately 500 seekers a day. You can find more than 3,200 acres of floating parcels on the lake. It's a huge mass of tangled water hyacinth of one meter thick, which formed itself over time. On this natural vegetation carpet laying on the water surface, the Inta gardeners put stringers and organic debris to form these growing boards in which they sow seeds or small plants. So that the floating gardens don't go adrift, tall bamboo sticks are planted in the ground on each side of the vegetation boards. The floating vegetable gardens cover today a quarter of the lake's entire surface. There are cultivated flowers, pod vegetables, squashes or cucumbers, but the gardeners' main incomes are made on tomatoes, the second most important production of Burma. It's 
a strange geometrical, unique and bewitching show which becomes sublime when the sun goes down on the mountains in the late afternoon. And Gafichon Monastery benefits from a privileged location in the middle of the floating gardens. It's an immense building made of old teak, which shelters an exceptional collection of Buddha statues and other statues disposed on richly decorated thrones or chests in the middle of numerous columns. its incredible stupas and its two ancient pagodas, Nyong Ohak and Chu Intain, we have to go to the southwest tip of the lake and navigate more than 8 kilometers on narrow canals with sometimes tumultuous waters. A few hundred meters away from the pier appears Nyong Ohak, which means Banyan Group. Most of the pagodas haven't been restored. They often are in a precarious state, have collapsed or enclosed in vegetation, but some of them are still remarkably preserved. The hti, the superior element in an umbrella shape, is missing on most stupas. When wandering barefoot on this place, we are fascinated by the charm and peaceful atmosphere which emanate from it, in the orange light spreading everywhere. At the bend of the path, we discover in the recesses hidden Buddhas and on spilled pediments and facades sculptures representing celestial beings and mythological animals. We can count more than 1000 stupas on the site, all from the 3rd century before Jesus Christ. Under a covered passage with sellers and traders of the temple lies a long amount of steps leading to the second group of pagodas named Shui In Ten and located at the top of a hill. We can find there the sanctuary built by the king Ashoka which shelters a golden image of Buddha in the mudra position. Shui Yanpie is without any doubt the most beautiful monastery of Burma. It's located near the village of Nayungshui on the road to Ihiho and is a wonderful tick structure on stilts with oval windows. It's likely the most reputed picture of Myanmar. The ordination room is luminous, has a shiny wooden floor, is richly decorated and in sight to silence and meditation. The promenade next to the temple is pierced by a multitude of niches in which enthroned Buddhas covered with red and gold fabric. These Buddhas are here to honor the numerous donators whom names are mentioned under the statues. Above the alcoves, beautiful frescoes, a bit faded, tell the story of Buddha's life. For our last day here, we decided to go on the lake's East Bank Road to discover on scooters another point of view of the Burmese countryside. We are overwhelmed by the quietude and the splendor of this crystal clear jewel 
surrounded by mountains and stripped with verdant gardens and colorful villages. It takes a bit more than two hour drive from the Inner Lake to go to one of the most beautiful hidden treasure of Myanmar, where a decade ago you still needed a pass from the authorities and the presence of a state guide to visit it. 2,478 stupas are lined up on one kilometer square of hillside, located in the southwest of the Shan state. The oldest are from the 3rd century before Jesus Christ. The site would have been edified under the ages of the Indian emperor Ashoka, then expanded by the king Longsitu during the 12th century while ruling over Bagan. The last tupas have been added during the 17th and the 18th century. Kaku is a religious devotion site for the Pao people in Myanmar. The site has largely been restored but underwent for the past few years severe damages due to the extreme weather conditions and earthquakes. It's a major place for meditation for the Pao people and the heart of their territory along with the city of Tongyi, 45 kilometers further north. The Pao people are very believers. They are 500,000 and essentially live on mustard agriculture and cordia, its white wood tree, pure and solid, that gives fresh, juicy and acidulous yellow fruits. This whole religious complex is also the center of a harvest big party celebrated each year in March. The Pao people gather to mark the success of the harvest, they pray, commune together, but they also gather to sell their hard work products and offer a part of their incomes to the pagoda to earn merits. We leave the Peyo country to go to Loiko, the capital of the Kaya state. It's not a well-known territory because it was closed to visitors until 2012. Before driving on the mountain's sinuous road, we stop in a monastery that overhangs the village of Demoso. The place is composed of Tokietong and Shuietong pagodas, also called silver pagodas, due to the silver color of their stupa. The view from the top of the hill is sumptuous. The village of Panpet, located in the Kaya territory, is our first stop of the day. We are traveling with a guide speaking the local dialect who obtained for us a special permit to go to this region. The main people living here, almost 300,000, are often called Kareni, which means Red Karen. We can find the main minorities, the Kayan, Kaya and Kayo people. Panpet is a Kayan village where women, also called Padong, meaning long neck in Burmese, are unfairly named giraffe women, 
which is a confusion made with several African ethnicities. There are 60,000 Kayan, and most of them became Christian under the influence of evangelical missionaries. We are invited in the big house of one of them. The woman welcoming us lives alone in these almost empty white rooms. Her children left and her husband died. Of course, at the beginning of our conversation, we ask her the meaning of her typical necklace made with copper or brass that the grandmother and mother's generation still proudly wear, so does some of the young generation to perpetuate the tradition. Girls start to wear it at the age of seven, she told us, and have their definitive necklace around 15 years old. Contrarily to what one might think, the necklace is not made with individual rings piled one on another. It's a spiral that they change for a longest one as they grow up. The spiral can have 25 circles and weight 5 kilograms. A lot of wrong things have been said concerning the reason why the Cayenne woman wear this necklace. It's neither to make them ugly to prevent them to be kidnapped by an enemy tribe or to look like a dragon king, which is a mythic representation in the Cayenne folklore. And it's even less to protect them from tiger's attack, which we know bite their victim's neck. Wearing the necklace, like the rest of their ornaments, is a beauty criterion a side to preserve their culture and is a form of freedom because they wear on them, with other leg and arm bracelets, their most precious goods that cannot be stolen from their home as it's on them all the time. And to break up with this false belief, the spirals don't affect the neck vertebrate, but are heavy on the clavicle. It's the rib cage that sags and makes the necklace fall down on the shoulders. When the space between the necklace and the top of the neck is important, the spiral is replaced by a longer one. If the spiral is removed, the muscles slowly come back up to find their normal position. Our host gives us fermented mie alcohol in an earthen jar that we cautiously sip with a bamboo straw. Ears of corn are drying, hanging on the kitchen ceiling. The room is almost empty. Only a few bowls, cans are there, and the space for the fire. Our guide translators is helping the old woman for the traditional rice sorting. In another house where we are invited to come in, the Kayan woman lives recluse in a tiny place, less than 10 meters square. This space includes her bed and the earth to cook in the wooden floor's recess. We talk about the difficult daily life, the food, essentially rice, which is cultivated here, vegetables and white chickens. We also talk about family, a very important thing for these people. They can have until 15 children. All of that while drinking mie alcohol. They grow rice and millet, dirty junket food. So it's not a normal less, just a white chicken. Oh, okay. So uh, the deer and what uh, fight to say is the bigger family. The bigger. For them before, the bigger family is 40, 50, 70. <laughs> Furthermore, in another village, another Cayenne woman prepares local tea for us. Mm. 
On a primary loom, she makes cotton scarves that she usually sells on the market. She also sculpts small wooden figures representing the Cayenne minority that she sells to tourists with some copper rings and bracelets. In the confines of a last group of dilapidated houses, we go meet another woman who makes thread thanks to a spinning wheel. The Kaya people are the most numerous people of the state of Kaya, almost 100,000 individuals, to which they gave their name. Their outfit is very different from the Kayan and have three main colors, red, black and white. The Kaya women have stupidly been called elephant women because of the large pieces of vegetal fabric they put on their knees. We spend some time in a musician's couple's house. They play with bamboo guitars, a melody they composed. Then the husband sings a song with a mandolin that tells the joy of receiving visitors and make them discover their culture. Most of the men are working in the fields. The next day, we go deep into the mountains in 4x4 to meet the Cayo, the smallest minority, 25,000 people only. Teko village is perched on hillsides at more than two hours from Loiko, far from everything. The population almost lives in autarky. 
destitution and insulation of the daily life of the Cayo people. The woman outfit is also very different from the Cayenne and the Cayo one. A pink top, a black skirt, large earrings garnished with colorful pearls, shell necklace, brass bracelets and rings, and copper spirals to their knees of 15 rings. There are smiles, benevolence, but also indifference. A woman is sorting rice with an enormous pestle working with feet. At the end of the village, women wash clothes and children take showers under a bamboo tube. of the afternoon, we take the road to Pekon, a small town located at the edge of the Sangar Lake. Today is Pekon's big market day, and it's swarming of people. Many Peyo came to sell their products. <coughs> There are some nice butcher stalls, many fishes of various size, the lake shelters so many of them, but also grilled rat and other local specialties. <laughs> Our plan for the day ride up the two big lakes, Sankar and Inle, to Nyongshui. We embark on a long motorboat at dawn. A morning red light makes beautiful the eastern mountains. It's freezing cold at water level. The light is gradually rising, the pastel colors are slowly warming up, it's a sublime and enchanting moment. After more than an hour and a half of navigating, we reach the northern tip of Sankar Lake, where the open market of Saga is taking place. 
it's the occasion for us to have a real big breakfast. Here again, you can feed on fried eggs, grilled spicy chicken feet, or many other things to which we are really not used. Peo minority is particularly present in the Sagar village. <laughs> the stupas and pagodas of the village of Tor Yarkon are standing not far away from Sagar. At the end of the monsoon, the monuments on the edge of the lake are flooded and two little towns can frequent one another only by boat. It will take us three more hours to navigate up the Inle Lake from its base, in the heart of sumptuous landscapes. It's the beginning of the second week. A small flight of 30 minutes takes us to the kingdom of Bagan. It's not possible to travel in Burma without visiting the Buddhist archaeological site located in Mandalay area. Even if the visitor rapidly noticed the impressive religious devotion of the people of Myanmar, nothing really prepares him or her to the overabundance of monuments in Bagan. Wherever you look, your eyes only see temples, stupas, monasteries and pagodas. This ancient city that we once named Pagan is located on the curve of the Iradi River and still shelters, despite of many distractions, more than 2,200 temples and stupas scattered on a plain of 50 km square. It was the capital of a powerful kingdom between the 9th and the 13th century. The different kings that succeeded one another built more than 10,000 monuments, but 80% of them have now disappeared. They gradually fell into ruins, especially the wooden monuments, such as palaces and dub houses, or have been destroyed by the several earthquakes that the region is used to. Shwezigon Pagoda is located on the edge of Nyong O village. It's in fact a big stupa in a bell shape, lying on three brick terraces decorated with many terracotta plaques, on which you can find scenes of Jakarta, which are the previous lives of Buddha. This stupa was a model for many others and is surely one of the most beautiful pagodas of Burma. King Anavrata has edified it in the 11th century to shelter a tooth and a bone of the Buddha's jaw, but it still seems new and shiny of many gold. Wandering on the marble slabs that borders the pagoda, we discover rest and prayers room, 
with blue or yellow colors, with richly made roof and several small temples and pagodas. We also see on the southeast side effigies of the 37 Nats, which are venerated spirits in Myanmar, such as the divinities of water, trees, home, etc., and are disposed in a way that pays homage to the stupa. We take the time to sit on the edge of the Iradi River at sunset. The pagoda Thadbinu is the highest structure on a site with a 65 meter height and has very specific characteristics. It's built on a 20 meters platform without central pillar and has a vaulted room on the first floor where you can see a tall statue of the seated Buddha. Three fake floors lead to the Sikara, a sanctuary tower, which almost has a cubic shape. The whole monument is covered with stucco and whitened with lime. The platform once was a monastery in earlier times. Monks lived in the corridors and in rooms on two levels. 10,000 bricks have been used to build the main temple. Mahabodhi temple have been originally built in the 13th century and was repaired later after the serious earthquake in 1975. It's a replica of Mahabodhi temple in Bodh Gaya, India, so it's very different from the other monuments in Bagan. It has a tower in a pyramidal shape placed on a square base, very ornamented. There are more than 450 images of Buddha enclosed in the wall of the four sides of the tower and on the two floors at the base. Ananda Temple is one of the most impressive of the plain. It's impossible to miss it with its 55-meter golden stupa and its 1,000 windows. It has an Indian architecture and shelters four 10-meter high Buddhas, each of them facing the four cardinal points. There also are 1,500 other representations of Buddha of modest dimensions. 80 frescoes describe the first steps of Buddha's life, from its birth to the moment it enters the lights. Like in several other temples, the devotees enter every day to put pieces of golden paper on the statue of their choice. Even the bhikkhus come to take pictures. Tilominlo Temple is a tall and majestic structure, 46 meters high, with two bricks floor covered with stucco, on which you can see ogres and mythological animals representation. Its conception is like the one of Sulamani, which has been built three decades before, and its name comes from its builder, the king Tilominlo. Here also, four Buddhas lean on its central pillar. Each side of the square temple has an entrance porch. Each of them are richly decorated. The entrance walls leading to the inside sanctuary have vaulted corner in which you can find small images of Buddha. When we wander in it, we are impressed by the wonderful wall paintings and the different colors frescoes of Buddhist representations, even if several of them are inexorably fading away. The construction of Damayangi Temple started in the middle of the 12th century. The King Narathu would have wished to erect this temple to, so they say, expiate his sins. To access the throne, he indeed chose to murder his father and eldest brother. If the construction has never ended, it's because Narathu himself was assassinated after only three years of reign. 
The temple has been built like the one of Ananda, but more massive and was very cared after. Damayanzika is a tall brick stupa on the east of Bagan. The main part of the stupa is like the one of Shwezigon Pagoda. Its base is edified on three pentagonal terraces decorated with terracotta plaques, which illustrate different period of Buddha's life. To the three terraces are added five little temples topped with Sikara, Indian-style sanctuary towers, The best mean of transportation in Bagan's plain is undeniably the electric scooter. We circulate on the sandy paths that wind between the desert stupas at sunset, and it's a moment we can't forget. Manuha Temple, in the village of Mienkaba, is a long and rectangular brick structure, 18 meters long, which shelters four Buddha statues, three seated and one laid down. This little temple at New Bagan's doors is original and surprising. It has no name but has a number, 1045. A local painter decided to reproduce the frescoes as they must have been like back in its edification's time. It's a unique way to realize the pomp and richness of the Burmese art of the time, imagining every other temple decorated this way. The sunrise in Bagan and the balloons flying off the plane to scatter in the sky is marvelous things to see that leaves you speechless. We print that image on our retina for long. The high place of Burma's history knows a constant growing influx of tourists each year, but is worth taking the time to fully discover it. We've been there four times. To wander in it or to get lost because you easily find yourself alone among the ruins and ancient monuments. It's also worth taking the time to leave these unbelievable and flaming sunsets, which set the plane ablaze. Kashin country will be the last destination of this sixth trip to Burma. We travel by car, the only solution, for more than three hours on a bad mountain road. 
first stop of the day, a copious breakfast in tavern very frequented by locals. It's the best place to soak up the atmosphere of the city. Chin State is the poorest and the most isolated of Burma. It's an area of mountains with hard winters and violent rain, which makes the few existing roads impracticable from May to September. Mindat is the capital. It's located on a 1,500 meters of altitude mountain ridge and is facing the mountains of Arakan in the northeast of the country. The village, very long, has many churches, Catholics, Baptists, Evangelists. Christianity is predominant here, whereas it's largely Buddhism in the rest of the country. Almost 80% of the population live under poverty line. They live to the rhythm of the sun, to feel labor, and daily markets, and women are, as elsewhere, largely put to use, especially for weaving, which is practiced almost everywhere in or in front of the house. We chose to come to Mindat during the State of Chin's National Day commemoration which takes place each year on the 20th of February. This is an important day for the Kachin people because this celebration is also a way to preserve, maintain their culture, their language and the Chin identity. This day is also a giant fair where every generation gather. They play, defy each other and dance in traditional outfits. wear their most beautiful outfits, they take pictures or selfies, their faces are painted with drawings representing their mother or grandmother's statues. Singing competitions are succeeding one another on the main platform. <laughs> Music bands are getting together to play old songs with gongs or tambourines, whereas dancers of all ages are doing ritual steps, war-oriented. Men are defying one another on an archery stand with impressed spectators. Mindat is the territory of Spider Woman, a strange calling for an extraordinary tradition old of several centuries, from the King time. 
To keep the Qin woman from being kidnapped and enslaved, they tattoo their faces to make them uglier. The differences between tattoos depend of the clan and highlight their membership to such or such clan. The oldest women still wear these remarkable geometrical facial tattoos. Here, like in several other Asian countries, they eat this funny chewing gum made with petal paste, tobacco and other spices, the whole thing wrapped into a wreck of leaves. This drug has stimulating powers or painkiller effects and is a real scourge for Burma. At many food stands, you can eat fried eggs or large crepes filled with vegetables or chickpeas. It's a familial festival with good-natured spirit. It's high in colors and is the pride of the Chin people. The last stop is in Yangon, the first country's city which is now the old capital of Myanmar, when the military decided in 2005 to create another one in the heart of the jungle for centrality issues. Shwedagon Pagoda is one of the most prestigious pagodas of the world and one of the most venerated in Burma. Built on Sagutara Hill more than 2,500 years ago, it majestically overhangs the city. Sitting on a marble platform of 5.6 acres, its main stupa is almost 100 meters high. It's composed and ornamented with more than 500 kilograms of golden plaques or small bells and also 7,000 diamonds, rubies, sapphires and other precious stones. Numerous bells and other religious buildings surround it but also hundreds of Buddha statues and other prestige are daily visited and honored by many faithful. Ceremonies take place here all the time in the several temples around the tall stupa. You can hear all together the sound of singing, bells ringing, the rustling of voices and the chants of mantras. One meditates, prays, honors with a golden leaf, or waters one's favorite statue. At any time of the day, we see Shinbyu procession, which is a ritual passage for boys to enter Shanga, a religious community, and give them a novice statue. Religiosity, serenity and resilience are part of the Burmese DNA. A people who underwent a lot, who still live difficult times, but whom generosity and benevolence imply respect and give you a real life lesson. A thing's for sure, there will be a seventh trip to Burma.